You are now listening to The Great Paranormal Debate with me, Kerry Ann. And don't forget me, Paul Rook. Good evening. It is Friday. Friday evening is 8 pm, and we are here to start your paranormal weekend in the right possible way. I am Kerry Ann, and you're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. Welcome and thank you so much for joining me. Tonight, I have with me my co host for the Great Paranormal Debate, uh, is Paul Rook. Hello, Paul. Hello, you all right? I am absolutely fine. Looking forward to tonight. Good, good. Yep. So it's we, gonna be a good one. It is. It is. I've been quite looking forward to this one actually. A little bit dubious because it's a little bit scary topic, but I'm looking forward to it. So okay. Tonight we're talking about to- articles that we've come across um, in yep. the newspaper and in the media um, relating to demons, aren't we? We sure are. Absolutely. So, I think we should get the sh- get the show started. I think you should go, go then. You, first. You've, you've got... No, 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 oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, okay. Fair, fair enough. Um, I was looking at an article in the Mail Online, right. and the headline was that police and medical staff documented America's real-life possession of, by um, official reports claimed that a boy of nine years old walked backwards up a hospital wall... And um, the police captain was too scared to enter the family's haunted house. Um, it's, it goes on to say, a nine-year-old boy walked backwards up a wall and a ceiling and started um, and startled medical staff um, as they looked on. Um, and his mother claimed that he had two siblings and both had been possessed by demons. Um the unlikely sounding event was detailed in official documents after a child services case worker and a nurse both said they saw the boy glide backwards on the floor, wall and ceiling. Both were shocked to see the boy apparently float, um, float after their mother had been um, subject to months of scepticism when they claimed her home in Gary, Indiana, was haunted and all three of her children were possessed by demons. Um, Now, I've actually looked at some of the photographs and stuff that's attributed to this account, and you've got, like, the picture of the house, and in the front of the house you can see, like, a white shadow of a man standing in in the glass panel, which is quite an interesting thing to see um but i don't to me it just looks like a bit of a case of pareidolia to be honest um which is basically seeing a familiar shape um in everyday objects um but what what do you have you did you read that article as well i did i did i mean from what i've got from the story is that it was actually the mother that they were mostly focusing on um, that apparently over a, a period of time that she was being possessed, um, as well as her three children. Um, there was lots going on within the home. Uh, she did end up having a lot of caseworkers involved, a lot of nurses involved, doctors involved, pol- the police um, investigators were involved as well. There's lots of author- that authoritative figures and people that work within um, services involved in this case. Now, each one of them said that they wanted, they went into this wanting to debunk it, wanting to prove that it wasn't real. And every single one of them that I've come across has said that actually, no, they, they see enough evidence for them to believe that this, there was something going on. Now, I, it doesn't tell you very much about what happened to the build up. It doesn't really say whether there was anything that I've come across. I don't know if you have seen it, that there was something that happened. Um, and, um, actually no, tell a lie. I did see something where they said that they felt that there was a curse or a hex placed on the mum. Did you yep, see that? Yeah, I vaguely remember that seeing that bit, yeah. Um, and that's where they think possibly that it could have come from, but that there had been other d- demonic, demonic work going on inside the home that had opened up this portal and that had enhanced that curse as well. So this is the kind of um, theory behind the activity itself. The, there was... From what I see, 
there was uh, one minor exorcism and three major exorcisms within the home over a period of time this wasn't something that happened overnight um but the the claims that she um what she, she claims her children was were um chanting that they saw a big black monster um they said that the police have actually got audio which features a demon rasping hay in the bar basement now although there was a lots of things that were going on in the home one it was that they um they experienced what they perceived to be oil running down um, the walls. Uh, one CPS worker um, said that when she touched the oil, um, it burnt. It made a, a it froze her thing. Made like a there was a picture of it. Her finger was frozen, um, and it gave her a blister when she touched this ooze that was dripping from the house, which was like an oil type um uh substance a catholic priest father michael Meg megnot i'm not sure if i pronounced that right i think that was about right yeah carried out the exorcisms um on the family in english and in latin and talks of his personal battles with the name demons now there's meant to be i think up to six entities in the home and one of those being a demon as such from what i've got I well mean, in really... in some in some of this article, it does actually say the family contacted churches, clairvoyants, and while the most of them would not listen, others gave them advice to wash the children's hands with oil and make an altar in the basement and burn sage and sulfur throughout the house, house which is the basic cle um, cleansing ritual. Um, now, it does also say that the clairvoyants warned that, um, that at the home it was haunted by... Uh, more than 200 demons. Yeah, oh, right, 200. Apparently wow. 200. I, That's early. a lot. Yeah. I know, I know. See, I I thought that there was only six there from what I read. Um, but they do believe that there was a portal to hell, I see that it was quoted as. Um, and that was, um, I think, a police officer actually mm. um, said, and that, like gave it that kind of name, a portal to hell, which... You know that that's quite. It demands quite a lot of attention, and for this is the thing as well. The people that are actually making these claims or actually um, giving evidence as these things actually what's going on existing are people of stature. This isn't yeah. just a vulnerable woman who's a single parent with three children making these claims. These are people within you know the church. The people within the police force. This is CPU. Like they even got so ch like children's services involved because of the children. So they weren't quite yeah. sure what actually was going on. Nurses, doctors. The doctors got the police involved when they felt like they were dealing with something that they couldn't actually treat. You know, it was a symptom. It was an yeah. illness. I mean, the doctor even says he remembers sitting in the doctor's um, office with him, and the child's head was spinning back, and his eyes were rolling back in his head, and he was making these noises, these growling noises, and that. And um, this was around about the same time that the grandmother was in the house, and the young boy was—he actually crawled the walls, and she was begging for the um, child to come down and for whatever was going on to be gone. You know, so yeah, yeah, it is. It's um, it's very, very. It, it's well it's a, it's a fascinating story very it very is, scary though i i'm quite um what's the word not not skeptical but i i just don't believe sometimes that when they go in to do the exorcism especially the catholic priests in particular i think sometimes they can make it worse if they don't understand what they're dealing with for one um because you, you've got demons from all different cultures. So a Catholic exorcism isn't going to be working on a demon from, I don't know, ancient Germania. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it just wouldn't work. Yeah. So you've got, you've got to really research what sort of demon you're dealing with and use its own power against it, so to speak. Yeah, see, I mean, this is something, this is when you're really going into, you know... Um, demonology yeah and it's such a fascinating um topic and there's so much there's so many levels to it that you can, we're only scratching the surface and we're not really looking at that kind of aspect to it but the story itself it was it was featured in a lot of um, newspapers it did do its rounds 
around about the time it happened, I remember seeing it on Facebook as suggested articles to read because obviously the association with the paranormal groups that I belong to. Um, and yep. it did cause quite a stir as well because it is a modern day exorcism. It is. So you actually, I, I do, actually do ex- exorcism. Uh, I do remember as well on, I, I think it was Facebook, they used to they share videos and stuff, and there was a little boy tormented, I don't, I don't know if you've seen it, a little boy tormented by a spirit, and this little child would be sitting on like a, a white garden chair, and you'd see the chair being, being violently pulled away from him. Right, I don't remember do seeing you, that. No, no. I, there, there was a couple of them, there was, there was that one, and the little boy again was grabbed by the ankles and pulled out the door, and must have been terrifying for him assuming that it was genuine yeah um but it's just hard to tell with those sort of videos yeah i think yeah i mean because i have seen quite a few um videos where people have alleged activity um you can't debunk the thing is with any um activity unless you're actually in the room unless you're actually in that position and you can take away all the variables and all the influences that you know could potentially make that or create such activity you're always going to have that dispute whether it's real or not. You're always going to have that because you can't yeah. tell for your, you can't say for yourself whether that was there or not. But in this particular instance, you have so many people involved, so many different people actually giving verification to what's happening and the activity. It really does make it a little bit hard to dispute it. I mean, yeah. there's always going to be that room where people aren't going to necessarily agree that, that you know what is being said happened, ha- did happen, but it does give it doesn't give that much room for that kind of um, that for them to be able to do that because of the the uh, people that are involved because of their stature because of who they are with their, you know respected within their community. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. It is. So like what what one? What one did you dig up then? Well, I didn't actually dig up a story, but I did dig up some articles. Now, this is something that I've always been fascinated in because um, of my, I mean, I've not really kept it a secret with um, what I do and my my humble beginnings within the paranormal and the um, energy realm that I work within um, or, you know, when I do investigations and stuff like that, I... My roots belong in spiritualism. Um, I, yep. That's how I entered the spiritual world as such, as in researching it and looking into it. Um, so one of the things that we did talk about as a training medium um, in a circle was shadow people. Now, there's lots and lots of articles online about shadow, uh, articles online about shadow people. Now, before I go into you know the story itself, um, my idea of what a shadow person is is the manifestation of a spirit that either has not long passed over and it's because there's not a lot of energy there and that is the most it can manifest as in you know when you see people at the corner of your eye and you know no one's there um or that you know it it is a spirit that is trying to manifest but hasn't been able to do it for whatever reason now that to me is what what a shadow person is but what is a shadow person to you um, see, a, a sh- obviously, a shadow is caused by the blocking of light. So you've got the um, absence of light, which is creating the shadow. Um, so it could be possible that it's strong enough to block the light to cause the shadow. Um, that That's just sort of one possible explanation. Um, but I, I do think sometimes... A pareidolia creeps in a lot as well. Um, it's I, I, I really don't know, to be honest. I, I've seen shadow people, and to be honest, I can't explain what they are. Um, when, I, when I went to Shrewsbury Prison, you just had this bloke's head just pop out of the one of the doors to look what he was doing, and then he'd pop back in again. Mm-hmm. So as to what that was, I really don't know. And there was no one up there. No. Um, so I, I really don't know. I, I just put that down to my imagination in the end, but, um, three other groups saw it as well. So it, by the end of the night, it's like, right, okay, that's like really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's something that happens quite a lot and quite common 
So I, I do, again, I, I take on board what you said about what you believe it is. I, I could quite understand that as well. Okay. Well, I mean, I do love the parapsych- parapsychologist in you, Paul. Yeah. And the logical. I will say that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what makes us so different and what, sh- what makes this so unique. So when I was looking into shadow people, I come up with two different terms. And I, it's my understanding they're one of the same, but I could be wrong. So if I am, there is lots of people in the chat room with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Please, if you know any different or Paul, then correct me. But the shadow man, I've got a small little story that I found about the shadow man rather than an article itself. It says in the 1960s, brother Tom and Tim Yancey of Lake Worth, Florida, both become the target of shadow man while playing in the woods surrounded their homes one afternoon. Tom gets an eerie feeling of being watched and Tim is chased by an unseen being that jumps down from a tree. Their parents dismiss their stories, claiming it was just an animal that they disturbed, but the brothers are adamant that it was a monster. That night, while Tom is asleep, Tim notes a do- notice a dark shadow move past the bedroom window. When he investigates, he, see a, he sees a black human figure pointing at him in the yard. He screams in terror and their father, a Korean war veteran suffering from PD- PTSD, rushes into the room. I don't know what relevance that has. Sorry. Tim says that a man in the yard, there's a man in the yard. But when their father goes outside to check, he finds nothing and berates the brothers. The situation worse, worsens. Tom begins to sleepwalk during the night and every time he wakes up beside the lake in the woods where they first encountered the shadow man. The entity eventually makes its way into their home and torments Tim by conjuring insects and dropping them on him while he sleeps. Desperate to find out what is going on, their mother attempts to use a Ouija board to contact the entity. However, the, she only makes the things escalate. It appears in the brother's room one night, crawling along the wall, and eventually attacks Tim, crawling at his rib cage and throwing him at the door, breaking both his collarbones. The father has enough and concludes that the boys are acting out, calling their so-called ghost the boogeyman and explaining that has time has come for them. Sorry, because they've been bad. Oh, the boogeyman has come for them because they've been bad kids. On the night of Christmas Eve, the brother sneaks down to look at the presents. They suddenly hear commotion coming from upstairs and the nativity set on the fireplace begins to shake violently, causing the ornament of baby Jesus to fall to the floor and shatter in pieces. The noise wakens their father, who storms downstairs and yet again becomes enraged. She throws the brothers out into the woods as punishment, where they become tormented by the shadow man for hours before their mother comes to their aid. Tom and Tim are victims of the shadow man for their childhood, entire childhood. They each move out when they are aged and see, never see each other again for a close to 40 years. The family reunite when their parents pass away and Tim, who is now a paranormal investigator, expresses his desire to cleanse the house and move back in with his wife and kids. Tom is reluctant but agrees. After a minor blessing of the house, the demonic entity is banished. Tim and his family move in and they continue to live there peacefully. So that is an experience that someone has with a shadow man, which kind of isn't really what my perception of a shadow man is, nor what your perception of a shadow man is really, is it? It more challenges it and leads it more down to the demon kind of... Yeah, I mean, I I can understand that um, a shadow person could be a demon that wants to hide its um, identity. That that could be another explanation for what they are. Um, mm. Now, James in the chat room, he said that maybe our brains can't see the true image, which would then work on the theory that they can um, they're out of sync with this with our realm sort of thing. Um, so maybe that's a, a good reason why we can't see them. And it yeah. is just literally the shadow. That's true. I mean, um, because in theory, with spirit, we're we're living in a different vibration to them. They live on a higher vibration than we do, in, in, in and, regards to how we work um, mediumistically or with energy. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think it works out to like maybe a foot. They just live yeah. like a high, you know, higher than us. So he has a very good point, and that could be what is happening. The fact that we are seeing but because of that difference in vibration we're not seeing the true form or because of the fact that you know we can't see the true form that we're seeing it in that kind of manifestation it's really interesting yeah i mean even even if they work on a different frequency that's why um 
some paranormal investigators use the ghost box because that works on different frequencies also, and that's mm. where we can get the voices and stuff from. I so love the spirit box. I do. I, I love that. It's yeah. uh, quite good. Um, Richard Clement says, I don't believe there are different categories of ghosts, i.e. shadow people. He said, ghost is a ghost. At the end of that. Very Which ignorant is, yeah. thing to say there, Richard. <laughs> Close mind. Sla- hashtag. Sl- yeah, hashtag <laughs> ignorant. Gone. A slap legs for you. All round. But, you wait until me and Kerry see you. And Dice, she'll give you one as well. But um, James <laughs> also went on to say that he's seen two shadow people and he kind of knew that they were both his nans. So I yeah. asked him in the chat room, how did he know that they were his nans? And he said they smacked me and licked my licked the hanky and wiped my face. <laughs> that would do it. That yeah, would do it. it. That, yep. that convinces you that, absolutely. That would, that would yeah, that would convince me as well. I'm pretty sure James as well. <laughs> I'm with you with that one. Yeah. <laughs> but looking at the um the topic of the shadow man, I did come across. Now I'm very very weird about. I'm not very weird. I'm very aware of um these fan made stories like um the Slender Man and stuff like that. Yep. I'm very aware of these. They're quite. They've become quite popular, haven't they? In um, they, today's society, they do, especially yeah. with the media and the films and stuff coming out. Yes, I mean Zo- Zozo was a perfect example. You know what? I've not heard of Zozo. I remember listening to you and Kerry chatting about the Zozo. Was it you and Kerry or you and Richard? I, uh, apparently, and uh, no, uh, it might be me and Richard or me and Kerry, one one of the others. Um, it was basically Zozo is supposed to be a basically a security guard of the Ouija board world. Wow. So you do a Ouija board and it'd come along and stop you and um, create all sorts of problems for you. That, But that was, the, the character was made for a film. I can't wow. remember what film. And I'm sure if Andy Mercer's in the chat room, he'll be able to tell us. Um, but it was literally made for a film. And people just jumped on the bandwagon. And there are people out there that even claim that they have seen Zozo. And it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Of course you have. We all believe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, I don't know. That's that's really strange. But then I do think that sometimes you plant a seed in some people. I mean, you get it all the time with different types of films. You're getting it at the moment with Fifty Shades Darker. I think sometimes films have got, got a great influence on people. You know, yeah. and, um, and because it's such, that it's such a massive part of our culture as a, as a form of entertainment, and some people can quite be quite easily. Um, uh, kind of um, influenced, but absolutely. I mean, what what impresses me more though is when, like for example, I went on a private investigation last night, and we got a name of what this supposed demon was going to be, um, and we really had to research really hard to find this name, and eventually we did find it. You know, and it it took quite a while to look into. Mm. Um, but we, we found out exactly what it was and how, basically how we can try and get rid of it for the for the lady. But um, that's quite. Yeah. I mean, there is so many. There is so many. There are. And there's different interpretations of each one as well. For example, I know I mentioned the Hat Man, and we have a Kyla. I want to say a Kyla. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, who says that the Hat Man is known as the Voodoo Spirit? Didn't actually know there was a Hollywood connection to one. Um, she's responding to Richard in the chat room. Um, but, she, you know, Kyla says that, you know, there is that association with the uh, voodoo man, the voodoo spirit. So, is, uh, uh, Papa Lip, is it Papa Lipba? Papa Lip, who's the guy? The voodoo king? No idea. No, New Orleans. Um, so, I don't know if you, Kyla, if you know the guy's name, please tell me, because I think I know who you're talking about, actually. Um, but the Hat Man, um, I've got a little article about the Hat Man, if that's okay. Um, the Hat Man appears much in the same way as shadow people do, but unlike the phenomena that was made popular by Art Bell and the Thunderstrikes, the Hat Man encounters in, bear a few striking differences that set it apart. When he appears, often during night, the Hat Man is always seen wearing a wide brim hat through most people unable to make out any distinct facial features. He is usually described as a black solid mass. Witnesses are often unable to describe the hat man's lower body as if it seems to float silently above the ground. So there is a actual witness there um, who, who speaks about the um, encounter he had. 
Um, and it says the phenomena seems to centre around basements and according to the experiences appear to manifest in situations of intense negativity, family dysfunction. In fact, many times if one person in the household has started to experience visits by the hat man, almost guaranteed that another family member will begin seeing the strange shadow man soon after. I mean, that can be interpreted though to lots of different reasons. You know, like we, we get influenced so easily by the people that we're around. Absolutely, and yeah, I, I see. I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced by this hat man thing. To be fair, it's just, it's just a shadow person wearing a hat. Do you know what I mean? Why, why are they distincting between the two? They're, they're, they're just the same. They're just one well, and the same. According to these articles, they're not. There's some distinct differences. And if a Kyla's right, and the hat man is associated with, um, yeah, Papa Leg, yeah, so. Thank you, Kyla. <laughs> um, and she, yeah, so he is completely different to shadow people. He's in. He wears a hat. That's what the difference is. He just wears a hat. How do, do we know, know the others? Are, you know, it, it's just a we hat. We will go into this. We, we, we haven't got enough time to, to go through the differences between um, the hat man and the um, shadow people, but there is this differences um if if the sh the hat man is not in fact a shadow person in the hat but the person that kyla was talking about which we can go on to us next week hopefully um but moving swiftly on we can't talk about haunted um cur well what, demons haunted objects or curses or anything without touching upon the warrens can we yep. really no, no, you have to mention the Warrens, don't you? And there is a plethora of articles. I love that. Do you know what? When I used to do this with Kerry, every opportunity she had, she would just crowbar that word right in there. And it just Basically, you mean there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does. But it just is nice to say. I'm such a weirdo. <laughs> so you can say that, but you struggle with other words. That, that makes that's like, amazing. When you I know. Yourself. You know like names are oh, so terrible they're so terrible um <laughs> so out of all that there's loads and loads of cases that the warrens have been involved with and i hope there's a plethora of them a plethora of cases and i'm going on the fact that i'm assuming everyone knows who the warrens are um uh, so i'm apologies if if you're not aware of them but they're really influential whether you agree with it for what reasons, you know, everyone's very different on, on what kind of influence they've had within demonology, parapsychology and re paranormal research. Um, but they have been really influential within that. Oh, sorry, my headphones are I don't know, falling out of my ear holes. So the one... It's because you've got big ears. It, well, no, little ones, I think, is the problem. Just, just <laughs> okay. don't fit in. I'm debating whether to go and get some duct tape and just sell a tape in them on. Um... The Go one case <laughs> that I was really interested in that I, uh, stood out for me was the trial of Arn, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson. And I'll tell you why, oh. right, that I well. found this because it kind of really highlights, for me, the dangers of messing with things you have no idea how to deal with, right? This is yep. such a big thing for me. I really do believe, right, I'm all for people pushing their boundaries and you don't know what you're doing unless you're experiencing it. But I'm, if you feel like you're ready for something, do it under an amazing teacher, as in let them yeah. teach you how to do it. <sighs> so, because I don't believe that people should do anything that they don't know anything about. Yeah, this, this kind of will give it a try attitude I don't agree with. So if you don't know, leave it alone. And if you want to know, find someone who knows really well ask lots of questions and watch them for at least two years before you even feel like you can do it yourself. Now, I, I totally don't know... agree with that. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And now, yeah. I don't know too much about Arnie, about his background, but I do know this story. So I don't know how long he was involved with Ed and Lorraine Warren, but he was involved with them in this case. Now, this case is titled The Devil Made Me Do It. So it's a trial that saw Johnson defend himself from manslaughter charges on the basis that he had been possessed. He had attorneys pointed to the recent possession of 11-year-old David Glatzel, who had encountered an old man while his parents were cleaning up a new rental property. 
The family began hearing noises in the attic and David experienced visions of demonic figure threatening to steal his soul. The Glatzels called the demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren, who witnessed the boy growling, hissing and being choked and beaten by invisible hands. They turned to an exorcism, but Johnson antagonised the demon during the trial ritual. Now, <laughs> he risked it passing on to him. I'm going to have to come away from the story because, oh, me as an investigator, don't antagonise. Like, really? You know, these are people. Some of them aren't very nice. Some are. I just don't agree with that. But that's my opinion. I'm just putting it out there. Um, so, although all Laura, Lorraine warned against it, Johnson investigated an old well on the rental property where the Warrens believed he become fully possessed by the demon, leading to his killing his landlord months later. The Warrens gave evidence at the trial, but in the end, Johnson was convicted of first degree manslaughter. Despite although he was, uh, despite this, he only served five years of his ten year sentence. Now, oh, I have other articles um, regarding what had gone on. Um, days after the stabbing, clergy members, paranormal investigator Ed and Lorraine Warren, John, uh, Johnson's mother and his girlfriend all claimed Johnson had been possessed at the time of the killing. The Warrens told the police that since July 1980, Johnson had participated in at least three exorcisms involving his girlfriend's 11-year-old brother David, who had been inhabited by 43 demons. I mean, what do you think? What do you think about that? Firstly, so, yeah. can I have your opinion on, on how you feel about people that antagonise um, okay. the An- investigation? Um, see, I, I am slightly guilty of doing that sometimes. Like um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, You're not meant to enjoy it, No, it, it's... it's <laughs> 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 it is, it, when, when we see you trying to get some activity, it is a bit frustrating, and especially when you know the spirits are there. And it's like, come on, you know, come forward, talk to us. We've come all this way to see you, and like you're being rude and ignoring us. So it's that sort of. I, I, I don't go right into it and like swearing at it and things like that too much. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's just no I getting agree, yeah. getting a little bit frustrated, I suppose, more than antagonising yeah. and insulting no, think, it and things i think we yeah. all have the, the the ability to kind of go if you're there step forward in a more kind of um pushy way yeah almost. I, I that, think it's such a strong word to use it's, it, it's slight respect. it's still it's still slightly in, antagonizing a little bit but you there is a line that you just don't cross and yeah i'd i'd I, i'm probably I probably do go quite close to that line sometimes, but there, there's just always that line where you don't cross no. um, to, to insult it and things. That, that's just wrong. Um, I agree. I mean, I, I do feel like these are people at the end of the day. I do feel that you have to have the utmost respect for these people. You yeah. Their home, their territory, their lives. Some have had the most wicked lives. And the last thing they want is, you know... A young pup going in there with a load of well, lights. Well, I'll, I'll give annoying. you an example. We we was using um, a Ouija board. We're doing a Ouija board session at the Ancient Ram Inn, and this spirit was like, um, if, "If you're here, can you come forward and talk to us?" Yeah, I'm here. You know, um, and it was like, "Right, okay. Do you are you happy with us being here? No. Um, okay. Do you want to communicate with us? No." Then can you go away and let someone else come on the board <laughs> that wants to talk to us? <laughs> you know, and it's and and it was like no, and I was like no, hang on a minute now. This is sort of getting a bit rude, like yeah. out of order. It's like at the end of the day, it's my board. If I want you to go, you're going. Yeah. Um, and in the end, I made it go. But you know, it, it's just that sort of thing. I, I'm quite respectful to a point, and then when it starts disrespecting me, then that's when I start disrespecting that as well it's, it's just the same as talking to someone face to face do you know what i mean if they're rude to you you're just rude back a bit you know oh yeah or you shut that conversation down which is you know what what you exactly find if, as you work as a medium and that stuff like that you you find if you come up come up against or come to or you have a energy that comes and it, the conversation isn't one that you wish to continue, then you shut that conversation down. Sometimes it's absolutely, other times. and and that's that's yeah. probably the amount of antagonising that I will do. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I don't really go overboard and start insulting it because that's just not on. No. Um, I mean, looking in the chat rooms, we've got some, you know, we've got Ma, um, a Kyla who says that she agrees that people shouldn't be doing anything that they don't have any um, knowledge in, investigator or medium. Um, Kerry Greenaway says she totally agrees with that. Don't antagonise. Um Mark as well. He he talks about um people that he watches on TV and how he doesn't agree with how they antagonise um spirits. Um and it is I mean it sounds like um to be fair, it's it sounds like we're all kind of of the same opinion that, you know, yeah. it has to be respectful, as a Kyla says. You you, know, you do, but I mean when when you get a spirit on there that is disrespectful to you, then I stand my ground. Because I'm not letting them take control. Mm. You know, it's, it's my board. You know, I came here to communicate with them. If they don't want to communicate with me, then go away. Let someone else do it. And, you know, if you start letting them take control, then there's no stopping them, really, at the end of the day. So you've got you've got to be firm and stand your ground. Yeah, I mean... Richard says living energy outweighs the spirit energy. And, you know, in a way you are right. Human energy always outweighs um, nature's energy or the environmental's energy. That is something that's scientifically proven. Um, you know, and, and yeah, you do, we do have that ability to shut things down. But I feel I, my personal opinion in this, in this instance is that you will come across something that no matter whether it's human or spirit will have a greater energy than your own. And it would be quite... I don't know, quite naive to think that you'd you'd always be able to outdo a spirit energy because I've well, been in a position where spirit energy has been a lot bigger than the collective human energy and it hasn't ended nicely. In fact, it ended quite hard, uh, harshly, you know. So, and again, we, there was no disrespect there at all. It just didn't want us there. And trust me, yeah. we left. <laughs> we left. <laughs> I, I heard the footage. That's right. Yeah, I heard that. Um, but no, I mean, you, you've got to stand your ground. Don't let, don't show any weakness because if you do show weakness, they will exploit it, and then there's no stopping them. That you know, they could come home with you, um, and you know, worst case scenario, obviously you've got the full possession thing, but that's quite rare. I think it's not something that's quite common. Um, so and don't you know, you've, the things you've you don't got understand to, as well. I no, think exactly. Biggest moral of the story here is just don't mess with things you don't understand but going Absolutely. back to the story of um cheyenne johnson arnie what do you think about that um i can't remember what you said now no um <laughs> i'll summarize <laughs> he went along to an investigation uh, an exorcism with the warrens um he antagonized that spirit um he then risked the, the chance of that spirit then possessing him against the warren's best wishes and judgment he then decided he was going to investigate a well which they believed the spirit had come from he then got possessed and he then went home and murdered his landlord he got arrested for it and he wanted to plead temporary insanity he had the warrens give evidence his girlfriend give evidence his mum give evidence all saying that he was possessed at the time that it happened and he still got served 10 years but only served five so what do you think? See, I, I wouldn't... It's, it's quite a complicated situation. I mean, yeah, okay, I can... Because, obviously, we do the paranormal investigations and I understand what could go on and I've got a, a small belief in spirits and stuff. But it's... Um, when when you get, obviously, into the cults, you they have to... They're ba Basically, they've got to admit that there is such things as spirits... And I don't think they're going to take much notice of a pseudoscience until it's actually proved that ghosts exist. They won't recognise that as a excuse. Well, I mean, I agree with you. I, at the moment, I'm studying studying my degree in um, criminology and psychological studies, and the amount of times I've been so frustrated with my books because it keeps refer it refers to astrology. Uh, paranormal um, as a pseudoscience to me it's real you know yeah. to me it's real whether you believe in it or not a parapsychologist in my perspective my opinion is someone that wants to prove that paranormal is fake 
or is being false, but in a way it's acknowledging that there is some existence of it, whether it's fake yeah. or real, there's existence of it. So it frustrates me. So I do understand what you're saying and the fact they don't take it seriously. It's very kind of Mickey Mouse kind of science that isn't really... I, I think they will get there. They they will get there at one point, uh, some stage. But I, I think even... I mean, didn't they even come out with a measurement for how heavy the soul was? Yes. Because uh, when you when you die, your body's like one. I think it's like one gram lighter than when you was alive. That's so they right. they the scientists actually believe that that's the weight of your soul. So if now they can, if if they believe that you have a soul, then surely at some stage in the future they're going to have to look at some of the paranormal activity that goes on, and maybe even learn from some of the stuff that we did. Exactly. I mean, you've just led me down the path of Constantine Karakterkov. I won't. I won't go there. I won't do it right okay. now. I haven't got enough time. But he <laughs> is the one that actually, actually, really, um, claimed and and believes he has proven um, and taken evidence, photographed the spot, the soul leaving the body, and has even told you in which order the soul leaves what part of the body it leaves first and that it can come back and go away and come back and yeah it's really interesting case study but i have gone on so much that and sarah moore are like my two favorite things (laughs) (laughs) yeah i know the sarah moore thing (laughs) (laughs) i won't do it tonight i'll put my reference in there enough for that um but yeah I, i mean i you know you can't really talk about this without talking about ed and lorraine they are really influential and have done some amazing stuff. But this, I have never come across this story or this case study before. And when I did, I found it quite interesting. And the reason why I found it interesting is because it firstly highlights, if you don't know what you're doing, what kind of impact that can have mm. on the person. Um, and also, you know, there's always someone that does know what they're doing. And if they're telling you not to do something, nine times out of ten, you should just listen. Because you're probably not yeah. going to know better. Especially if you're going to... I mean, this is Ed and Lorraine. I mean, why would you not listen? If you're under them and you're working with them... Well, I, I do, I do think... to their work. We, I mean, with Ed and Lorraine Warren, um, I obviously I've heard of them and, you know, I've got a huge respect for them. But I think what doesn't do them any favours is these films that keep coming out, like The Conjuring, The Conjuring oh, yeah. 2. And it obviously puts a movie spin on it and... It just makes it a little bit too far fetched now, and it's almost like they're out, they're out for money. And do you know what I mean? To me, it's like really, why would you put your name to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, as I said, I've got huge respect for them, but the the films are not not doing them any favors. Um, sadly, which you know is a great shame, but that that's just the way I think, you know. I know, and and if you think these people, this is their life work. I mean, we spoke last night with Jack the Ripper's um, case study with Russell Edwards, and that you know, talking to him, you can hear how much goes into a case study, how much yeah. energy, how much life, how much you know, sacrifices. You can hear the emotion when they speak, and I I can only assume that that is the case when with someone that is investing their life into something. They invested their life into yeah this demonology and and the um you know they've done study days and lectures and all over the world so this is their life's work and when you do think that you know hollywood has taken that and kind of made it into something that it might not necessarily have been it's sad because you know they have been they have done amazing work it is and and I, i you know i think most of their work is just exactly what we do, sitting in a dark room, calling out for nothing to happen. You know, <laughs> it happens to us all the time. Do you know what I mean? And it's like it probably the same with them. Yeah, well, I definitely so, wouldn't go as far as comparing myself to them, but I'm sure a lot of their research. Well, no, that's what, that's what I mean. You know, they they would have at some stage in their career just sort of done exactly what it. we do. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Sat there in dark rooms, calling out for things to happen, and nothing happens. So uh, why did they? Why I, I don't understand why they would have put their name to the conjuring in particular, because that just ruined it, really. 
Well, I and I think, that, yeah, I, still I mean, R- Richard Richard Clements in the in the chat room, he said a lot of people don't listen to Ed and Lorraine Warren in the paranormal field, but then that could be because of these movies and stuff, you know, just giving them, um, you know, making them um, incredible. Yeah, no, it is. I, it is sad, right? Because I mean, although I agree with what is being said in regards to how Hollywood has had an influence on their careers and their life work, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that you know. Um, I mean, with Richard's comment, a lot of people don't listen. I do feel like that they set the bar. I do feel like that they've made had such a massive input. And influence that sometimes we we probably are doing things that we don't realise was established from that, you know. So yeah. I do. I think they give they they deserve more credibility than what they're getting at the moment because of the fact of the conjuring and stuff like that. Um, and they did help a lot of people and stuff. But anyway, we're complete completely off topic. We have kind of more talking about demons than we're talking about um Ed and the rain. Um, well, there, there was demon. There was a demon in the conjuring too. The best comedy of 2016. In Paul's opinion. No, it is. It's hilarious. In Paul's opinion. <laughs> I, I, I dare you to go and not <laughs> laugh at it, I'll tell you. I, I was a little bit behind cushions. Like, I was a little bit scared. I don't know. But then I can't do obvi- horror films. I, you was obviously know. watching the wrong film. No, no, no. Definitely watching that one. Definitely behind a cushion with the light on during oh, the day. Dear. I am oh, no good. No. Um, but Akila says murder through possession. Not sure on that, but spirit, spirit influence on fault and minds. Yes, I think is possible. I'm not sure, but wasn't there one case in the USA where a court recognised the testimony of a woman's spirit? Her husband had murdered her, and the spirit showed her murder to her mother, and it was ruled reliable. I didn't know that. Wow, yeah. that is something else, isn't it? Uh, that'd be quite radical if that. I'm that definitely happened. going to look that up after we've been yeah. on the show. But it is now quarter to nine and everyone is getting ready for the Mark Manley and Kerry Greenaway, Kerry Greenaway and Mark Manley show. Oh, um, I'm on that one as well, I think. Yes, oh, uh, hashtag Paul is on every show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ch- start charging royalties, I think. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, um, yes, so we usually do our paranoia. So... This week's Paranori is a little bit different. It's not an urban legend as such. It's based on true events, allegedly. Um, but this is something that I've spoken about recently, uh, before. I find it quite interesting. There's been a film based on it. There's been a song based on it by Tenacious D. Um, and I'm going to tell you about it. So the story is based on a blues magic- magician. See, I can say... You mean, you mean musician. But I can't say... <laughs> Can't say musician. Okay, so Robert Johnson is a world famous blues player whose life is was of about twenty seven years, largely known outside of the rumours of his um, bargain with the devil. According to legend, as a young man living on a plantation in rural Mississippi, Robert Johnson was branded with a burning desire to become a great blues magician. Oh, musician! Sorry, he was instructed. Oh God, (laughs) what's wrong with me? He was instructed to take his guitar to a crossroad at midnight where he was met by the devil who took the guitar and tuned it. Then the devil played a few songs and then returned the guitar to Johnson, giving him the mastery of the instrument in exchange for his soul. Robert Johnson was able to create the blues for which he became famous for. Sun House, who once retold the story, said it was the only explanation for Johnson's rapid mystery of the guitar at such a young age. Johnson often encouraged the legend rather than backing away from it and wrote songs such as Me and the Devil, which presented lyrics such as Early this morning when you knocked upon my door and I said, Hello Satan, I believe it's time to go and continues with You may bury my body down by the highway side so my old evil spirit can catch a greyhound bus and ride. To this very day, tourist attractions in Clarksville, Mississippi mark the very rock crossroad where Johnson allegedly sold his soul to the devil, showing just how powerful the legend is, as well as how interesting the mysterious life of Robert Johnson was. Now, there's actually a curse associated with this man. Um, He, it's 
called Crossroads um, and he made that song, he, he produced it and sung it but it was then redone by other artists who then covered it in their albums such as, as Leonard Skinnard, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that word they're the guys that was on the plane when the plane crashed and it just so happened that it happened just after they released that song or the album that it was on the Allman Brothers had um, a tragedy befallen them and Eric Clapton, who recorded the song, um, lost his son to a fall from a window. So they associated lots of um, mishaps or, you know, ill fortune because the song was recreated by these artists. So it had a little bit of a curse attached to him. And the origin of it is the fact that he'd sold his soul to the devil. What do you reckon, Paul? Interesting. Yeah. Best, best coincidences ever, though, I think. Oh, God, you've got to love the parapsychologist in you. And there's no such thing as psycho. And there's no such thing as psychologist. There's no such thing as coincidences. I'm so sorry. My words are terrible. There is. It, it's just bad things happen. And because, obviously, they played the song beforehand, they've attributed it and connected it, and it's got nothing to do with it. I don't necessarily believe that there's such things as coincidences don't but that doesn't necessarily mean that i'm right and you're wrong it just means that i don't agree with you i i believe everything <laughs> happens for a reason yes yes so you don't believe in coincidence you're, Paul. you're fated to do something so it's just a bad coincidence that it happened like that they played that song and they were destined to die shortly after but because they did, people wrongly connected the two together. So just so happens. So it's a song coincidence. Associated... There's a what well, that many times. Yep. Why not? Why not? Literally, the only answer you can have to that argument. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Why not? Why not? Well, I don't know. But I found that, I mean, the song itself is quite, I don't know if anyone's listened to the original. Um, in Mark's professional opinion, he is the Mac Dad Daddy of, um, well, he just said Robert Johnson is the Mac Daddy. He's great. So, you know, it, it is, it, that song's really good. And also they've taken that and so many different people have then made it their own. And coincidentally, have had something really bad happen afterwards. Hmm. It's certainly interesting anyway. Yes, it is. So with yeah. that, it's been a really fascinating show. Um, we are drawing to the end now. We have um, Kerry and Mark on next with the Dark Knight show. What are and don't forget, don't forget you have to refresh the screen as well. Yes, yes, you do. Um, otherwise, it's not going to come up straight away. This one will just stay there. So yeah, once this show's finished, just refresh it and keep refreshing until you see Dark Knights come up. And then push play and enjoy because it's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm, it's water cryptoids tonight, isn't it? Well, yeah, water cryptoids. And uh, do you know what? I've I've actually had. I spoke to Kerry um, yesterday, and she was giving me a long list of all the cryptids that Mark wanted to talk about. And mm. I think I've probably heard of one. Really? <laughs> so he's yeah. found lots of new and wonderful and amazing yeah. ones that people are going to want to so. listen to and learn about. So, I think that for the next hour and a bit, it's just going to be Mark talking about cryptoids that he knows about. <laughs> and maybe throwing a couple of crystals that Kerry can use to conjure them. That's it, yeah, absolutely. Or throw at them to get them away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you see this big amethyst coin, well, what you do is just throw really hard. Do you know what? She'd kill me. She'd kill me. It's... The fact that I'm even talking about, she's looking at the amethyst cr point right now and going, don't worry, she doesn't mean it. Oh. I, will, I will get her tomorrow. That's what she's doing right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm at this point. <laughs> All right. well, I'm I'm ready to say goodbye. Are you? Yes, that's yeah. I'm I'm ready. And goodbye, everybody. Thank you for listening. It's been absolutely brilliant. And I shall see you all again in a few minutes. Yeah, five minutes. So don't forget, keep refreshing the page. Bye. Bye bye.